What's up guys, today I'm happy to share with you an interesting opening for black against white's first move pawn to e4. And what I love about this opening is that although it is highly tricky, it is also very solid at the same time. Because a lot of tricky, tricky openings are unsound if your opponent is playing proper moves. But now this one. I'm talking about the so-called Holmov Gambit. So you start off in a standard way, pawn e5, and after that you develop your knight counter-attacking his pawn on e4. In this case, most of the players will take on e5. In a moment, I'll tell you what to do if they don't. And here comes the first surprise. You don't go for the Petrov defense or the Stafford Gambit. You capture the pawn on e4 just like your opponent did. And here's a surprise factor. Lots of players are aware of this position being a famous opening trap. And it says usually that white wins here by playing queen e2 attacking this knight, and if knight goes back, white wins the game. Now, in reality, we're not gonna go back, but I'll show you what, what what's the trap they're hoping for. So they're hoping that you move your knight away, and then white wins with this knight to c6, discover, check to your king, and they're gonna grab your queen on the next move. And the problem for lots of players is, is that this trap is all they know about this opening. But we aren't gonna go here. Instead, let me take this back. After they played queen e2, guess what you do? You just keep mimicking their moves and you also play queen e7. And this opening is highly underrated. I have to confess that I also thought for a long time that it's just an inferior variation and black has nothing here. Little did I know, it's very tricky, very interesting. So here, you counterattack white side here, but of course, they'll be happy to grab your knight on e4, because why not? And then you play pawn to d6, aiming to get this knight back. Well, it can't move this away because it's pinned to the queen, to the king, like it's pinned severely, and therefore the knight certainly cannot move at all. In most cases, your opponents will play pawn to d4, trying to solidify the knight, and after you capture, they hope to enjoy their extra pawn. And at first, it seems as if you just blunder the pawn for no reason, but it's super tricky. Bear with me for just a moment, you'll enjoy it, I promise. So here you go, knight to c6 and you start your counter-attack. Currently you attack this pawn twice. And although white can defend it in different ways, it fails so badly. For example, one of the most common moves, bishop to f4, the most natural development move, and also overprotecting this pawn on e5, fails to a very interesting and creative line. You go pawn g5, attacking this bishop. And if it goes back, you can get this pawn on e5. Therefore, they just drop it back to g3. And this is an arrow played by even masters and GMs. Because here you play pawn to f5 all of a sudden. And you once again take advantage of the pin over the e-file. They can't take this pawn on Poisson, because in this case, they hand their queen in one move. They're gonna capture it and win the game. But they can't do it, let's take it back. Which means that they have to move their queen away. And as they do that, you keep marching this pawn forward f4, and all of a sudden this bishop on g3 is trapped. And thanks to this line, you're just winning a piece for nothing. Plus, this pawn on e5 is weak, you're gonna take it on the next move just as well. And you simply win a piece with a winning position. Another common way for white to defend the central pawn in this key position of this opening is playing pawn f4, which looks like the easiest solution for white. And like white is just protecting this pawn once and for all. You then go bishop g4. You want to develop your queenside pieces and castle queenside because, you know, thanks to this queen to e7 move, it's easier for you to castle there. And so you go bishop g4, preparing to get castled on the next move. In this case, the most played move by white is a natural bishop b5, putting the pin to this knight and threatening to capture it on the next move. At first, it looks like white is up a pawn and is completely dominating, and it's hard to believe that this position is already losing for white. <laughs> As I've told you, it's very tricky. Uh, I mean, it's, it's incredibly difficult to figure it out unless you are really well familiar with all these variations. Now, the trick here is that instead of trying to defend this knight somehow, you just counter-strike with the move castle queenside. And it's a rare case where your casting is actually a very powerful attacking move, it turns out. So, after the casting, you're threatening to go rook d1, thanks to the support of this bishop from g4. And rook d1 will create like a complete devastation of white's position. It will attack the king. On the next move, you can grab the rook, and you can actually, you know, grab other pieces as well. Plus, this king of white will be under the fire. You can keep chasing it with queen c5 or queen h4. So, rook d1 is really a deadly threat. On top of that, another move that which is unpleasant for white is knight to d4. If you can jump there, if white does something to, you know, cover their king, and you jump to d4, uh, that attacks this bishop, 
That also prepares for your other bishop to count to c5 and together with the knight you attack these pawn on c2 and you just can see how your attack easily and naturally overpowers white and it's really difficult for white to handle this position. One of the most common ways for white is simply to castle because it looks like the easiest way to handle this rook to d1 threat but as white castles it turns out that they fall in another trap. This time it's queen to c5 with a double attack to the king and bishop, therefore winning the bishop on the next move. A quick announcement, we are hiring. Therefore, if you'd like to join our team of Remote Chess Academy, work with me, it's a remote job by the way, then you may be interested in it. Uh, please read the, all the details in the description below and you may apply. Also, if you happen to know somebody who may be interested in this position, please share it with them and if they happen to be hired, you'll get a referral bonus of $250 from us as a thank you. Back to the home of Gambit, we already know that when white tries to hold on to this pawn on e5, that often leads to quite unfavorable circumstances for them. Therefore, one of the best strategies for white is just to forget about this pawn and to simply develop. In this case, they often go bishop b5 trying to pin your knight this way. You just go bishop d7 to neutralize the pin and to get ready for your king to castle on the next move. If they castle, you do the same. Let's say they develop by going knight to c3. By the way, bishop f4 might fail in the same way as we have seen previously. You can still go g5 and then pawn f5, exploiting all the same tactical motif. As the queen goes away, you, you push the pawn forward. So the, the opening remains to be highly tricky. Anyway, let's get it back. So let's say I just forgets about this pawn and just say, okay, I'm, I'm not gonna care, I'm gonna develop. Then you can get it back, because why not? Uh, finally, you can get it back. Before that, you can also include one more useful move, pawn to a6, forcing this bishop to make a decision. If they take on c6, great for you, you'll get a super active bishop over his over this diagonal, putting pressure onto the king and queen side, that's excellent. If not, if they just keep playing normal moves, then at this point you can finally take back this pawn on e5 and regain your material balance. Now after, let's say, white keeps trading here, now these queens are also in tension, so let's say they trade over here, this leads to an equal looking endgame and nevertheless, even here, white often ends up being in trouble, strangely enough. Because here, after they go, let's say, bishop f4, what you can do is you can always put this bishop to f6 and put pressure over this knight and pawn. It's even stronger to go knight b6 first. And you have this plan that from here the knight can possibly go to c4 and attack this pawn. If white plays any move, whatever, you go bishop f6, putting more pressure to this knight, to this pawn, knight to c4 is coming, or you can just take and destroy their pawn structure. And actually this position is probably already technically winning for black. So of course it's a little bit more advanced level thing, but for an intermediate level player, this is certainly a very comfortable position to play and you can actually still convert it to a win. All right, let's talk about a few other common sidelines so that you know what to do if your opponent sidesteps. So in this position, the main move for white is pawn d4, defending this knight on e5. Some folks go queen a4. They hope to remove their queen from this pin, but what they fail to notice is that the knight is pinned anyway. This time it's pinned down to the king, and therefore queen a4 doesn't do anything. You can just go bishop to d7, attack the queen, and the knight is still pinned, it can't move. Therefore, queen a4 to be, no, you know, she's just completely useless, but has to move the queen again, and then you just get the knight back on e5, life's good. Let's take it back. Uh, what if they play pawn d4 first, following the main line, but after you take here, instead of capturing with a pawn, they decide to trade queens by playing queen takes e5. You're actually fine with it. This is also a surprising thing about this variation. You're fine going into an endgame being a pawn down, because thanks to your a little bit of an advantage in activity, you still create a lot of problems for white. Currently you attack this pawn, if they defend it with f4 or whatever, you go bishop f5, gaining one more tempo to attack this pawn. After they play c3, you castle queenside, and you can already notice that you have nearly finished your development and white is still completely passive. Also, you want to play bishop c5 on the next move, control this vital diagonal so that they can never castle in the future, and that would be unpleasant for white. If they notice that and play bishop e3, then what you can do is you can undermine the central pawn chain and start attacking that way. So you can play a brutal move pawn to g5, trying to undermine this pawn chain. So if this pawn goes away, you can capture the other pawn on e5. And since white's king is centralized, actually opening the center is a good idea. If they try to keep the position closed, then after this trade on f4, anyway, you open this g file that you can use. You can also play a move bishop h6, and if let's say they just develop or something, you can take here on e5 using this little tactical trick called a pin. So the pawn is pinned. 
And you can see that even in an endgame, it's actually highly tricky for white. Bishop takes e3, you regained your pawn, you're attacking this knight, your other rook is ready to go rook e8 and potentially attack along the e-file, attack this pawn on e5, so here you are just winning. Of course white could have and should have played other moves, but anyway you have a lot of compensation and a lot of attacking ideas here. There is another line that you really must know, because otherwise you can get checkmated in five moves, really. So here, if white captures, you recapture, so so far it's really simple, you just mimic your opponent's moves. Here they may play queen f3 instead of queen to e2, alright? So queen f3 creates the threat of queen takes e4, but also the thing that sometimes people blunder, it's it threatens queen takes f7, because white has the knight over here, which supports this thing just as well. So just don't blunder queen takes f7 checkmate. It's very easy to handle that, you can just drop your knight back. There are other ways as well, but this is the easiest one, and there is nothing white can do. Then you go d6, kick this knight away, and continue your development. Here they in most cases play bishop to c4, still insisting on their attack against this square, but it's actually a bad move, because after d5, you shut it down and you force the bishop to go away. Nevertheless, it's actually the second most popular move in this position for white to take on d5, which is a miscalculation. It is defended by your knight and queen, so you just take it and you win a piece. So after an exchange of queens, you're up a piece, and that's end of story for white. Finally, what if they don't want to take your e5 pawn at all? In this case, they'll need to defend their own pawn on e4, and therefore they'll play knight to c3. Then you just keep playing same moves, knight to c6, and after bishop c4, which is the most common for white, now you've got a very interesting tactical trick. It's a small one, but it often helps you to win the game. It's knight takes e4. It's not even a sacrifice, because after they accept this sacrifice, you go pawn to d5 and you regain your piece right away. But your opponents are usually completely confused, they don't know what to do and they go down and lose games badly. I've got another video where I analyzed this particular variation in greater details, and therefore if you plan to try out with the Helm of Gambit, you may wish to check this video next so that you know how to proceed in this case. Let me know if you have any questions and have a great rest of the day.